alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen Wa usalli wa usallimu ala nabiyyina Muhammad Khatamin nabiyyina wa imamin muttaqeen Wa ala alihi wa ashabihi wa atba'ihi bi ihsanin ila yawmiddin Amma ba'd and so on this night, the 26th of Sha'ban of the year 1441, after the Hijrah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, coinciding with the Gregorian calendar of being Sunday the 19th of April of the year 2020, we deliver this lecture over the internet for our Muslim brothers and sisters all over the world and we thank our brothers at Sunnah Saga from Canada in facilitating this lecture Ayyuhal ikhwatu wal akhawat in this session of ours today inshallah we shall revise together the inheritance of the prophets and messengers and that inheritance is al-ilm is knowledge qala sallallahu alayhi wa sallam al-anbiya lam yuwarithu dinaran wala dirhama wa innama warrathu al-ilm the prophets didn't leave behind wealth dinar and dirham as their inheritance. وَإِنَّمَا وَرَّثُ الْعِلْمِ Rather that which they left behind as inheritance are or is knowledge. And the beginning of the hadith, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made it quite clear, leaving no doubt that the scholars are the inheritors of the prophets qala sallallahu alayhi wa sallam al ulama warathatu al anbiya that the scholars are the inheritors of the prophets and so that knowledge that the prophets left behind is known as their inheritance and those that took their inheritance are the, are the scholars, the ulama that exist in every time and in every age. And for this reason, Ubaidillah ibn Kathir, rahimahullah, narrates that his father said, Mirath al-ilm khayrun mi mirath al-dhahab wal fiddha that the inheritance of knowledge is better than the inheritance of gold and silver. Why is this the case? Then that which we say this is the case because knowledge, its benefit surpasses a person. Its benefit surpasses a person. And that's why the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, إِذَا مَاتَ بْنُ آدَمْ إِنْ قَطَعَ عَمَلُهُ إِلَّا مِنْ ثَلَاثِ the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, if the son of Adam passes away, then all his actions are cut off, except for three. From them, knowledge, in which he leaves behind, whereby the people benefit from that knowledge. Ayyuhal ikhwat wal akhawat, we gather tonight in this lecture to speak about a month that the early Muslims would want to witness rather they would supplicate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that they witness this month قال معلى ابن الفضل رحمه الله كانوا يعني السلف يدعون الله ستة أشهر أن يبلغهم رمضان معلى ابن الفضل رحمه الله said that they meaning the salaf used to supplicate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala six months prior to Ramadan 
before Ramadan that they actually reach and witness the month of Ramadan. From the supplication was as Yahya ibn Abi Kathir rahimahullah said كان من دعائهم اللهم سلمني رمضان وسلم لي رمضان وتسلمه مني متقبلا يحيى ابن ابي كثير رحمه الله he said that from their supplication meaning the supplication of the early muslims the pious the pious predecessors from their supplication was oh allah Keep me safe till Ramadan. وسلم لي رمضان and submit to me Ramadan. وتسلمه مني متقبلا and take Ramadan from me in the case and it being accepted from me. That you accept my Ramadan. A month أيها الإخوة والأخوات whereby the gates of the skies and the heavens are opened a month in which the gates of the hellfire are closed a month in which the shayateen are locked up فعن أبي هريرة رضي الله عنه أنه قال كان صلى الله عليه وسلم يبشر أصحابه يقول قد جاءكم رمضان شهر مبارك كتب الله عليكم صيامة أبو هريرة رضي الله عنه mentioned that the messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم would grant glad, glad tidings to his companions and say the month of Ramadan has come to you a blessed month a month in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has obligated upon you and made compulsory upon you the fasting of تُفْتَحُ فِيهِ أَبْوَابُ السَّمَاءِ The gates of the heavens are opened in that month. وَتُغْلَقُ فِيهِ أَبْوَابُ الْجَحِيمِ And the gates of the hellfire are closed in that month. وَتُغَلُّ فِيهِ الشَّيَاطِينِ And the Shayateen are locked up and chained up in that month. Fihi Laylatun Khayrun min Alfi Shahr. In it, meaning the month of Ramadan, is a night which is more virtuous and better than a thousand months. Man hurim khayraha faqad hurim. Whoever is prevented from its good, then he truly has been prevented. And this is what the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to grant glad tidings to his companions when the month of Ramadan would arrive. As the nights go by and the days move on, we arrive closer to the beginning of the month of Ramadan. And when this happens, then the Muslim must be mindful of two main things. How many things should the Muslim be mindful of? Two main things. The first, that he isn't to fast a day or two before the beginning of Ramadan. A Muslim isn't to fast and shouldn't fast a day or two before the beginning of the month of Ramadan. The second thing a person shouldn't do and be mindful of is that they don't fast the day of shak, the day of doubt. So two things. The first, that a Muslim isn't to fast the day or two before Ramadan. And the second, that they shouldn't fast the day of a shak. With regards to fasting the day or two, a day or two before Ramadan, then the proof of that is the hadith of Abi Hurairah radiallahu anhu, whereby he said that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, لا تقدموا رمضان بصوم يوم ولا يومين. إِلَّا رَجْلٌ كَانَ يَصُومُ صَوْمًا فَلْيَصُمْهُ Abu Hurair رضي الله عنه said that the Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم said Do not precede Ramadan 
by fasting a day or two before it begins except for the case of a man who habitually used to fast then let him fast and so the messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam he made an exception illa rajulun kana yasumu sawman falyasum except for the case of a man who habitually used to fast then let him fast and obviously the case of a person who used to habitually fast is like a person who fasts Mondays or Thursdays. He fasts Mondays and Thursdays. He's been fasting for the past 15 years, 10 years, 5 years, year, 6 months, 3 months. It's a habit. He's taken a habit. So if that Monday or that Thursday coincides with the day or two before Ramadan, then if he fasts, then it is permissible and there's no blame upon him. And the wisdom for that, the wisdom for the Muslim not being allowed to fast a day or two before Ramadan is that the nafil, the voluntary fast isn't connected consecutively with the wajib, the obligatory fast the obligatory fast being the month of Ramadan the nafil, the voluntary fast being the month of Sha'ban and such that a person doesn't think that the two are the same it is legislated to split between the two and that's why the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam prohibited the fasting the, the day or two before Ramadan. Similarly, we said that a person must be mindful and he shouldn't fast the day of a shik. And so what's the day of a shik? Then that which the Fuqaha Rahimahullah Ta'ala they say, the day of shik is the 30th day of Sha'ban. In the case that the sky is overcast and unclear, um, Usually it being to be dull or it being cloudy. So we actually don't know if this 30th day of Sha'ban is a completion of Ramadan or is, is a completion of Sha'ban or if it's the beginning of Ramadan. So it's the 30th day of Sha'ban. We weren't able to see if the sky, we weren't able to see the previous night if the sky is showed that the moon had been sighted why we could, couldn't we see because it, it was overcast it was dull it was unclear so we complete it we complete it as being 30 days do we fast on this 30th day no we as muslims are prohibited from fasting this day قال عمار بن ياسر رضي الله عنهما من صام اليوم الذي يشك فيه فقد عصى أبا القاسم صلى الله عليه وسلم عمار بن ياسر رضي الله عنهما said Whoever fasts the day of doubt, meaning the 30th day of, of uh, Sha'ban, in the case of skies being dull and overcast and unclear, then they have disobeyed Abu Al-Qasim, the Messenger of Allah, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And as the month of Ramadan begins to be announced, Upon the sighting of the moon, because obviously as Muslims we don't announce the month of Ramadan due to calculations, we only announce the sighting, we only announce the month of Ramadan and the birth of the crescent. Upon sighting the crescent, Muslims begin to congratulate one another. As Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu said, كان صلى الله عليه وسلم يبشر أصحابه يقول The Messenger of Allah وسلم with the Quran glad tidings to his companions and say جاءكم رمضان شهر مبارك the month of Ramadan has befallen you has come upon you a blessed month and upon commentary of this hadith Al-Hafidh Abu Al-Faraj Abdurrahman ibn Ahmad ibn Rajab ibn Al-Hamdi rahimahu Allah ta'ala made commentary and he said قال بعض العلماء هذا الحديث أصل في تهنئة الناس بعضهم بعضا بشهر رمضان هي رحمه الله تعالى said that this hadith is a proof in people congratulating one another upon the entering of the month of Ramadan and then he goes on to say رحمه الله تعالى كيف لا يبشر الغافل how is the heedless one not granted glad tidings بوقت يغل فيه الشياطين how is it that the heedless person isn't granted glad tidings of the chaining up and the locking up 
of the shayateen. How is the heedless one not granted glad tidings? And without a doubt, the heedless person and the non-heedless person in general is granted glad tidings and Muslims congratulate one another upon the birth and the beginning of the month of Ramadan. And so when Ramadan is announced, the most important form of worship begins. As it relates to the month of Ramadan. The most important form of worship as it relates to the month of Ramadan begins. And that is the ibadah of a siyam. The ibadah, the worship of a siyam. And the reason why we fast is for no other reason except to attain a taqwa. No other reason except to attain a taqwa. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not in need of a human being leaving his food or leaving his drink. قال صلى الله عليه وسلم من لم يدع قول الزور والعمل به والجهل فليس لله حاجة في أن يدع طعامه وشرابه. The Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم said Whoever doesn't give up forged speech and evil actions and doesn't abandon foolishness, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala isn't in need of his leaving of food and drink. And so if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala isn't in need of a person leaving his food and drink, then we understand by that and from that, that the goal of fasting is in order to attain a taqwa. قال الله تعالى يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا كُتِبَ عَلَيْكُمُ الصِّيَامُ كَمَا كُتِبَ عَلَى الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala informs us in the Qur'an and says O you who believe fasting has been prescribed unto you كُتِبَ عَلَيْكُمُ الصِّيَامُ كَمَا كُتِبَ عَلَى الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ As it was prescribed unto those who came before you لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ Such that you may attain and gain a taqwa and so we now understand that the sole aim and goal of a person fasting is in order for them to increase and attain a taqwa. So a question arises. A question arises. If the sole aim and goal of fasting is to attain taqwa, backbiting, sins, gossiping, tail carrying, being foul, foul mouthed in Ramadan. Does that break the fast of a person? If a person backbites, if a person sins, if a person gossips, if a person carries tells, does that break the fast of a person? Then that which we say is that without a doubt that these actions have an effect upon the fast of a person. لا شك. Without a doubt that these actions have an effect upon the fast of a person. And without a doubt they have a detrimental effect whereby they decrease the reward of a person. They decrease the reward of a person. However, we do not say that this month of Ramadan, when a person backbites, we do not say that he has broken his fast. And the reason why we say that backbiting doesn't break the fast of a person is because invalidating the fast of a person requires dalil. Invalidating the fast of a person requires dalil. Muftaqirun ila dalilin shar'i. When we invalidate the fast of a person, on what basis have you invalidated that fast of a person? You require dalil. And the origin is that there's, there exists no dalil to suggest the invalidating of the fast of a person who backbites. There exists no dalil to suggest that the backbiting of a person committed in the month of Ramadan invalidates the fast of a person and for this reason Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbar radiallahu an when he was informed about a man who says inna al-ghibata tufattir that backbiting nullifies a person's fast qala al-imam Ahmed ibn Hanbar radiallahu an law kanat al-ghibata tufattir ma kana lana sawm Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbar radiallahu an he said if backbiting was to nullify the fast then we'd be left with no fast. If backbiting 
was to nullify the fast of a person, لو كانت الغيبة تفطر ما كان لنا صوم then we'd be left with no fast and this goes to show how Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal رضي الله عنه was from taqwa and warai that he رضي الله عنه bearing in mind his imamah in the deen and the level that he reached he himself deemed that his state of affairs was a state of affairs that weren't praiseworthy and that was obviously from his humbleness when he says ما كان لنا صوم لو كانت الغيبة تفطر ما كان لنا صوم if backbiting was to nullify the fast of a person then we'd be left with no fast that's out of his humbleness for him it's rarity for us looking at him that's out of his humbleness and that just goes to show that the Muslim should be a humble person and on the topic of uh being insulted verbally or someone speaking to you foul-mouthed what is legislated for the person what is legislated for the person does he just stand there does he listen does he retaliate does he act back does he reply the same insult that was said to him then the answer to that is the hadith of Abi Hurairah radiyallahu anhu fa'ana bi zinad aw fa'ana bi salih az-zayyat annahu sami'a Abi Hurairah radiyallahu anhu yaqul qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam qala Allah ta'ala fa in sabahu ahadun aw qatalah falyaqul inni imra'un sa'im Abi Salih az-zayyat Abu Salih az-zayyat rahimahullah said that I heard Abu Hurairah radiyallahu anhu say that the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said with regards to the fasting person if anyone insults him or fights him then let him say in imru'un sa'im I'm indeed a fasting person and so if someone is foul mouthed by another person bad mouthed by another person insulted by another person what does he say I am a fasting person and that leads us to define what fasting is and the technical Islamic usage of fasting is as our fuqaha rahimahum Allah ta'ala say at-ta'abudu lillahi azza wa jal bil imsaki anil mufattirat min tulu'i al-shamsi ila ghurubiha the worshipping of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in abstaining from the mufattirat and nullifies of the fast from dawn break till sunset. And we're going to break down this definition into three main chunks. The first, At-ta'abudulillah. The worshipping of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For indeed, ayyuhal ikhwatu al-akhawat, fasting is an ibadah. As-sawmu ibadah. Fasting is an ibadah. It's a form of worship. And every form of worship requires the intention Every form of worship requires an intention. And that's why we say, At-ta'abudu lillahi azza wa jal. The worshipping of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what that means is, if a person fasts, because he's on a diet, if he fasts, not having food, because obviously beggars can't be choosers, and so, because they don't have food, they abstain from food. If they just don't want to have food, or if they're on a hunger strike, is that counted as fasting? La, it's not counted as fasting. Why? Because this person is not doing it out of worshipping of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They're doing it for their own reasons. Whether that be because they're on a diet, whether that be because they have no food, whether that be because they don't want to, whether that be, they be they're on a hunger strike. If the fasting of a person isn't for the worshipping of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then it's not recognized Shara'an Islamically as a fast. So that's why we say At-ta'abudu lillah At-ta'abudu lillahi azza Bil imsaki anil mufattirat In abstaining from the mufattirat From the nullifiers of the fast And we're going to come to that In a short while And then we mention The time period Of this fast And this abstaining Qala fuqaha'una rahimahumullah Min tulu'i shamsi ila ghurubiha from dawn break till sunset. And so that's the period of the fast. 
With regards to the nullifiers of the fast, then the nullifiers of the fast, ayyuhal ikhwa, wal akhawat, are seven in total. The nullifiers of the fast are seven in total. The first, food and drink. And that's quite clear. Food and drink, that's quite clear. And the proof of that is the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, وَكُلُوا وَشْرَبُوا حَتَّى يَتَبَيَّنَ لَكُمُ الْخَيْطُ الْأَبْيَضُ مِنَ الْخَيْطِ الْأَسْوَدِ مِنَ الْفَجْرِ ثُمَّ أَتِمُّ الصِّيَامَ إِلَى اللَّيْلِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, and eat and drink until the white thread, يعني the light of dawn, appears to you distinct from the black thread, meaning the darkness of night. ثُمَّ أَتِمُّ الصِّيَامَ إِلَى اللَّيْلِ Then complete your psalm, your fasting, till the nightfall. And so this is the proof that food and drink are nullifiers of a person's fast. The second matter, which is deemed as a nullifier from the nullifiers of the fast, are those matters which aren't food and drink. They're not food and drink. However, they act as a substitute for food and drink. Uh, such as the various types of shots, nutrients injection, injections uh, that a person may take in order for them uh, to be provided energy. So we can't say this person has, ta- has eaten because they haven't eaten. We can't say this person has drank because they didn't consume a liquid. Um, what did they do? They took an injection, a nutritious injection that nourished their body. And off of the back of that, it provided them energy. This breaks the fast of a person. The third nullifier from the nullifiers of the fast is intimacy. The third nullifier from the nullifiers of the fast is intimacy. And the proof that intimacy is nullified from the nullifiers of the fast is a statement of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said with regards to fasting يَتْرُكُ طَعَامَهُ وَشَرَابَهُ وَشَهْوَتَهُ مِنْ أَجْلِ That the fasting person has left off his food, his drink and his desires for my sake. And so when a person performs intimacy with his spouse, has he left his desires for Allah's sake? Then the answer is no. And so that is why we say intimacy is a nullifier from nullifiers of the fast. And with regards to intimacy, then this is the most severe of sins committed by a fasting person. The most severe of sins committed by a fasting person is intimacy. And because it is the most severe of severe severe of sins, it carries the most severe expiation. And the fuqaha rahimahum Allah ta'ala, they say when a person performs intimacy with his spouse during the daylight period of Ramadan while fasting, then five things before that person. How many things before that person? Five things before that person. The first, sin. He is now sinful. Which obviously means that he has to repent. The second is the invalidity of his fast. The invalidity of his fast. Meaning that his fasting is invalid. The third matter that befalls him is that he must continue with his fasting. So we can't all of a sudden say, because I've broken my fast, I'm going to stop there and go and have a snack. That which we say, as a punishment for you, you continue with your fast. The fourth matter that befalls that person is that he obviously now has to make up for that fast. He has to make up for another day. And the fifth and final matter is that he must carry out the kafara, the expiation. And this expiation has three main stages. The first thing that he must do is emancipate and free a slave. So now because he's committed intimacy with his spouse during the daylight period of Ramadan while fasting, then upon him is to fulfill and carry out the expiation. What's the first thing he has to do? He has to go and find a slave. He has to what? He has to go and find a slave. And as our fuqaha, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserve them, mentioned that there exists no slaves today. There exists no slaves today. 
And so that which exists today from slavery that you might hear is not actual slavery, rather it is human trafficking. Human trafficking. And so that's the first thing. They must emancipate and free a slave. They can't find a slave. Then the second matter or, or stage of that expiation is to fast 60 days. Two consecutive months. And they must be consecutive. You can't break up. And if you break those 60 days up, where, whereby you fast 10 days and then you take a pause for two days and then you carry your fast, that which the scholars rahimahullah ta'ala say that you have to start your 60 days all over again. You have to start your 60 days all over again. So that's the second stage. You can't find a slave. You can't emancipate a slave. You can't free a slave. The second stage. You fast 60 days, two consecutive months. You're unable to fast two consecutive months. You don't have the ability. Then you turn to the third stage, which is to feed 60 poor people. Upon you is to feed 60 poor people. And so that's with regards to the third nullifier of the fast, which is intimacy. Intimacy. And we said that intimacy is the most severe sin committed by a fasting person. Because of that, it, ha- it carries the most severe expiation. The fourth nullifier from nullifiers of the fast is the ejacul- ejaculation of semen. And so if a person ejaculates semen voluntarily, then he has nullified his fast. He has nullified his fast. And the reason why we say voluntarily is because if a person ejaculates semen through a wet dream, then he did not do that voluntarily, and therefore his fast is valid, and there is no sin upon him. All he has to do is just perform a bath and carry on with his fast. However, if he ejaculates semen voluntarily, then he now has nullified his fast. By Maddalil, what's the proof? Then this very same hadith you mentioned, the hadith of Abi Hurairah radiallahu an, whereby he said, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, with regards to the fasting person, he leaves off, he leaves off his food, his drink, and his desires. When a person voluntarily ejaculates semen, has he left off his desires? No, he hasn't. He hasn't left off his desires. The fifth nullifier from the nullifiers of the fast is bringing out forth of blood. They bring out forth of blood. Uh, a typical example of this is hijabah. Hijama. And the proof that hijama nullifies the fast of a person is that hadith whereby the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam walked by two individuals who are performing hijama on one another in al baqiyah in the month of Ramadan. And so the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, أفطر الحاجم والمحجوم The one who cups and the one who's being cupped have both broken their fast. They've both broken their fast. So they bring out forth of blood. And we said an example, hijama. Another example is donating blood in the month of Ramadan. Donating blood in the month of Ramadan is a nullifier from the nullifiers of the fast. And the reason why we say that is because both al-hijama and donating of blood make the donor and that person receiving the hijama and the cupping weak and feeble whereby it may harm them. It may harm them. That is with regards to the fifth nullifier from the nullifiers of the fast. The sixth nullifier of the, from the nullifiers of the fast is vomit. Is vomit. And vomit is a nullifier from the nullifiers of the fast. قال صلى الله عليه وسلم من درعه القيء فلا قضاء عليه ومن استقاء فعليه القضاء. The Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم said whoever is overcome by vomit then there is no making up for that day upon him. However, whoever intentionally vomits then upon him is to make up for that day. وَجْهُ الْإِسْتِدْلَالِ مِنَ الْحَدِيثِ 
the way we use this hadith to support our point is that had vo- intentionally vomiting not been the nullifier from nullifiers of the fast, there wouldn't have been the need in order to make up for that day. And so the sixth nullifier from nullifiers of the fast is vomit. The seventh nullifier from nullifiers of the fast is menstrual blood. Menstrual blood. And if a woman happens to all of a sudden receive um, receive her menstrual cycle, then she has broken her fast. And her fast is nullified. And the proof of that is the hadith of Mu'adah ibn uh, bint Abdullah al adawiyya Whereby she said, asked Aisha radiallahu anha, the wife of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, ما بال الحائض تقضي الصوم ولا تقضي الصلاة Why is it that a menstruating woman makes up for her fast and she isn't commanded to make up for her prayer? قالت أمنا عائشة رضي الله عنها أحرورية أنت Are you from the حرورية? And the حرورية were a group of people that lived in حرورة They lived in حرورة and they were the خوارج and so when Aisha radiallahu anha sensed a type of questioning that resembled the questioning of the Khawarij, she asked her that question, Ahruriya anti, are you from the Haruriya? And so anyone today who comes to us with the same rhetoric of Ahlul Bid'ah, we say to them, Are you from the Ashairah? Are you from the Maturidiyya? Are you from the Kullabiyya? Are you from Jama'at al-Khwal Muslimin? Are you from Jama'at al-Tabliq? Are you from the Haddadiyya? Are you from the Sururiyya? Are you from the Qutubiyya? Same way as Aisha radiallahu anha said, Ahruriyatun anti? Are you from the Haruriyya? And then Mu'adha al-Adawiyya, she said, I'm not from the Haruriyya, but I'm just asking. And so Aisha radiallahu anha said, Kana yusibuna dhalik fa nu'maru bi qadai al-Sumi wa la nu'maru bi qadai al-Salat. That menstruation used to happen to us during the lifetime of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and we were commanded to make up for the fast. However, we weren't commanded to make up for our salat. And the reason why Aisha radiallahu anha said, Ahruriya anti, is that because she, as we said, sensed a type of questioning from the questioning of the khawarij. And the ulama rahimahumallahu ta'ala mentioned in the explanation of this hadith, that the khawarij, they stick to the zahir of the Qur'an. They stick to the apparent verses of the Qur'an. And they show little acknowledgement to the sunnah. They show little acknowledgement to the sunnah. And you heard them many a time saying, you, you heard them many a time quote, quote, quoting verses from the Quran. In al hukmu illa lillah, amra la ta'budu illa iyyah. Afa hukmu al You find them, subhanallah, from old until present, quoting verses from the Quran. And so that's why Aisha radiallahu anha, when she sensed that, she said, Ahruriya anti. And whoever comes to us in this time and age with the same scent and the same type of question as the question of Ahlul Bida', we, we, we answered with the same answer of our mother radiallahu anha wa radaha. Aisha radiallahu anha. And so the seventh nullifier from the nullifiers of the fast is menstruation. We do not invalidate the fast of a person up until we establish three main things. If anyone falls into any one of the seven nullifiers of the fast that we've mentioned, then we don't invalidate their fast up until we establish three main things. The first, and yakuna aliman, that they should know that this nullifier nullifies their fast, meaning that they shouldn't be ignorant. If we establish that they're ignorant of this, then we do not nullify and invalidate their fast. The second, that he should remember and be in state, a state of being woke and awareness and alert that this nullifier nullifies the fast. Meaning that he shouldn't be in a state of forgetfulness. Because if he does it in the state of forgetfulness, then we do not invalidate and nullify that person's fast. Just as the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said about the case of a person who drinks and eats in the state, state of forgetfulness, قَالَ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَسَلَّمْ مَنْ نَسِيَ وَهُوَ صَائِمٌ فَأَكَلَ أَوْ شَرِبْ فَلْيُتِمَّ صَوْمَةً فَإِنَّمَا أَطْعَمَهُ اللَّهُ وَسَقَاهُ He said, Allah alayhi wa sallam said, whoever eats and drinks whilst fasting in the state of forgetfulness, 
then let him complete his fast. For indeed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was who fed him and gave him drink. The third matter in which we must establish if a person commits and carries out a nullifier from the nullifiers of the fast, that they did that nullifier with intent. Meaning that wasn't against their will, neither were they forced. That that matter wasn't against their will, neither were they forced. And the proof of that is the statement of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam رُفِعَ عَنْ أُمَّةِ الْخَطَأُ وَالنِّسْيَانِ وَمُسْتُقْرِهُ عَلَيْهِ The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has said that blame is raised and lifted off of my ummah from three and he Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned from them a person who was forced and acted against his own will and so these three conditions are stipulated in order for us to nullify and invalidate the fast of a person then we move on to the fasting of a sick person with regards to the fasting of a sick person then what we say is that a sick person is one of two a sick person is one of two the first is a person who is sick and we have hope that that sickness shall leave them so they're sick and we hope that that sickness shall leave them and they have hope that that sickness shall leave them an example of this is a person with a common flu uh, a person who uh, uh, is vomiting usually that person has we have hope that they inshallah they're going to get well over the coming following days what does this person sick person do they break their fast and they make up for it and it's as simple as that sick person they have a flu they can't fast un- unable to fast fasting is going to harm them they break their fast and they make up for that fast the second type of sick person is a person who has little hope that that sickness shall leave them they have little hope that that sickness shall leave them such as a person with terminal illness such as someone who's very very old someone who suffers from old age someone may Allah subhanahu wa protect us all someone who's been diagnosed with cancer and they, 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 they're told that this type of cancer they are probably going to die from it in these days COVID-19 the coronavirus it's a reality people are dying if a person is diagnosed with that then that which the ulama rahimahullah ta'ala say that this person doesn't fast what do they do? they don't fast rather they give the badal they give the badal and that badal is the feeding of a poor person for every day he has broken his fast so 30 days you feed 30 people and the proof of that is the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala وَعَلَى الَّذِينَ يُطِيقُونَهُ فِدْيَةٌ طَعَامُ مِسْكِينَ and as for those who are able to fast with difficulty then they have the choice to either fast or to feed a miskin, a poor person for every day and so that's the case of a sick person that we say there are of two types a person whose sickness is short term and a person whose sickness is long term then we move on to fasting whilst upon a journey fasting whilst upon a journey when we speak about fasting whilst upon the journey then the ulama rahimahumallah ta'ala say that a person looks to his own case and that which he finds easiest a person looks to his case and that which he finds easiest because the breaking of a fast is a concession it's a rukhsa from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala قَالَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى فَمَنْ كَانَ مِنْكُمْ مَرِيضًا أَوْ عَلَى سَفَرٍ فَعِدَّةٌ مِنْ أَيَّامٍ أُخَرٍ Whoever from amongst you is sick or is on a journey, then for him is to break his fast for another day and make up his fast for another day. Similarly is the statement of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to Hamza ibn Amr al-Asrami رضي الله عنه هي رخصة من الله فمن أخذ بها فحسن The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam 
he told Hamza ibn Amr al-Islami radiallahu an that the fasting upon a journey is a concession from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whoever takes it has done well. And the reason why we say this, that a person looks to his condition and his own case, is because both have occurred in the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Both breaking the fast whilst upon traveling and both and fasting upon a travel have been authentically narrated from the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. With regards to breaking the fast whilst upon a travel, then the proof of that is the hadith of Jabir ibn Abdullah radiallahu anhuma. Whereby he said that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he set out for the conquest of Mecca on the eighth year. And he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was fasting up until he reached the valley of Qura al Ghamim. And Qura al Ghamim is the valley known as today Wadi Usfan, situated between Mecca and Medina. And he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was merciful. As Malik ibn al radiallahu anhu said in that hadith, Wa kana sallallahu alayhi wa sallam rafiqan rahima. And he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was one who was soft and merciful. Jabir ibn Abdullah ibn Amr ibn Haram radiallahu anhu then says, and so when he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was informed that some had fasted while they bore the difficulty of that, he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam called for a cup of water which he elevated in order to see the, show the people that he is about to drink and then he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam drank. It was late, later said to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that some people had fasted. And then he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, أُولَٰئِكَ الْعُصَاتِ أُولَٰئِكَ الْعُصَاتِ he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam reprimanded them and said they are the disobedient ones, they are the disobedient ones. And so here we establish that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in one instance he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam broke his fast. In another instance we have proof that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam fasted upon a travel and upon a journey whereby we deduce the permissibility of fasting for the traveller. As Jabir ibn Abdullah radiyallahu an mentioned kharajna in another hadith kharajna ma'a nabiyya sallallahu alayhi wa sallam fi yawmin shadeed al-har hatta in kana ahaduna la yadu yaduna ala ra'sihi min shiddati al-har wa ma fina sa'imun illa rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa abdullah ibn rawaha he said, we set forth out on a journey with the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on a scorching hot day. So much so that one of us would place his hand over his head due to the severity of the heat. And there existed amongst us no one who was fasting except the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Abdullah ibn Rawah. They were the only two that were fasting. And so, that which a person asks is which is better. Since there is establishment of Sunnah Prophet fasted, and in another instance, he Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam broke his fast, what does a person do? Then that which the ulama rahimahumullah ta'ala, they say, is that a person with regards to being on a journey finds himself in three states of affairs. Three scenarios. The first is that a person fasts and from his fast he's going to face he's going to face severe difficulty. Fasting upon that journey will cause for him severe difficulty. Then that which we say is that this fasting for him is muharram and impermissible due to the statement of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam they are the disobedient ones, they are the disobedient ones. And in another hadith, it occurred that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was upon a journey once. فرأى زحاما ورجلا قد ظلل عليه He sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saw people crowding around a person and a person being provided shade. And so when he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was asked, they told him he was a fasting person. قال صلى الله عليه وسلم ليس من البر الصيام في السفر. It is not from righteousness to fast whilst upon a journey. 
So that's the first scenario. That a person fasts while they face severe difficulty. We say that this is impermissible for a person. The second scenario of a person, the person that fasts, however, they, they enjoy little difficulty. They enjoy little difficulty. That which we say about this person who faces little difficulty is that fasting with regards to him is makruh, is disliked. Why is that the case? Let me say that is the case is because breaking your fast upon a journey is a rukhsa, it's a concession from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, since He has provided for you this concession, then it's not befitting for you to turn away from this concession. Qala sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, inna Allah yuhibbu an tu'ta rukhsuh. Indeed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves that the believer carries out those concessions that he makes for him. So that's the second scenario. That he fasts, enduring little difficulty. And we say that this is disliked for the person, makro. The third scenario a person might find themselves in is that whether they fast upon a journey or whether they don't fast upon a journey, it's the same. They fast upon a journey, no problem. They don't fast upon a journey, they break their fast, no problem. What do we say about this person? Then that which we say is that you should fast upon the journey. The next matter we move on to is suhoor. It is authentically narrated from the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa that he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has said, تَسَحَّرُوا فَإِنَّ فِي السُّحُورِ بَرَكَةً Eat and take the pre-dawn meal, for indeed in the pre-dawn meal is barakah. So what is the ruling of taking the sahur? Is it wajib? Is it recommended? Then the answer to that question is, is that it is highly recommended. It is highly recommended. And within the suhoor, ayyuhul ikhwat wal akhwat, lies many benefits and forms of good, both pertaining to the worldly life and pertaining to the hereafter. Similarly, the suhoor isn't specific to any type of food. So some people have the belief that if you don't have this food, you haven't had your suhoor. This is incorrect. Suhoor isn't specific to any type of food. From the wisdoms of taking the suhoor is number one, following and emulating the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam instructed towards this. The second wisdom in taking the suhoor is adhering to his command sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Adhering to his command sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Whereby he, he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Tasahharu, take the pre dawn meal. And eat the pre dawn meal. The third wisdom with regards to taking the suhoor is that it is in opposition to the people of the book. A person opposes the people of the book. As the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has said, فَصْلُ مَا بَيْنَ الصِّيَامِنَا وَصِيَامِ أَهْلِ الْكِتَابِ أَكْلَتُ السَّحَرِ The difference between our fast and the fast of the people of the book is the eating of the pre meal, the eating of sahur. We then move on to the night prayer. The night prayer, ayyuhul ikhwat wal akhwat, is legislated in the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Since the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it was authentically narrated from him that he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam led his companions three nights in a row in the night prayer. And on the fourth night, he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam didn't lead them. وَقَالَ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ إِنِّي خَشِيتُ أَن تُفْرَضَ عَلَيْكُمْ I feared that it might, might be made obligatory upon you. And with regards to the night prayer, then it is the son of the Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم to pray them 11, as 11 units of prayer. قَالَتْ عَائِشَةُ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْهَا كَانَ النَّبِيُّ صلى الله عليه وسلم لا يَذِيدُ فِي رَمَضَانَ وَلَا فِي غَيْرِهِ عَلَى إِحْدَى عَشَرَ تَرَقْعَ عَائِشَةُ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْهَا said that the Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم didn't increase in Ramadan and outside of Ramadan more than 11 units of prayer.
And so we say it is from the son of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that he prays 11 units of prayer. However, if a person increases due to the hadith of Ibn Umar radiallahu anhumah whereby the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said Salatu al-layli mathna mathna If a person increases in more than 11 and he prays 20, 23 units of prayer due to the hadith of Ibn Umar radiallahu anhumah whereby he said the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that the night prayer is to be prayed in two, two units of prayer then there is no harm with regards to that. And actually it was the state of the people during the time of Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu an that they would pray 23 units of prayer. It was also narrated from Ubay ibn Ka'ib radiallahu an the great companion of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that he prayed, used to pray the Taraweeh prayer 20 units of prayer. Ata ibn Abi Rabah, who was in Mecca, in our blessed city, Sharrafah Allah, he used to say, أَدْرَبْتُ النَّاسَ وَهُمْ يُصَلُّونَ ثَلَاثٍ وَعِشْرِينَ رَكْعَةٍ I encountered the people in Mecca, and they, were, they, they would pray 23 units of prayer. Similarly, during the time of Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, Dawud bin Qais, رحمه الله, said, أَدْرَبْتُ النَّاسَ بِالْمَدِينَةِ فِي زَمَنِ Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, وَأَبَانَ بِنْ عِثْمَانَ يُصَلُّونَ سِتًّا وَثَلَاثِينَ رَكْعَةٍ he said, I encountered the people in Medina in the time of Umar ibn Abdul Aziz and Abani ibn Uthman, the son of Uthman ibn Khattab, the son of Uthman ibn Affan, and they would pray 36 units of prayer and they would perform witr with three units of prayer. And so it isn't correct to your ikhwa to say and to refer to a person who has prayed more than 11 units of prayer that this is a bid'ah. It isn't correct to say that a person who prays more than 11 units of prayer, that this person has performed a bid'ah. Without a doubt, if he sticks to the 11, then this is a sum of Prophet and this is better. However, if he prays 20 or 23 units of prayer, then that person still is upon khair and is upon guidance. Um, we're not going to delve too much into Salat al-Layl because the scholars, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserve them at the head of them, Samahat al-Mufti, in this year, 2020, of the year, the year coinciding with the year 1441, 1441, after the Hijrah of the Messenger of Allah due to COVID-19, then Salat al-Taraweeh will not be performed in the Masajid. And so that which we say is that a person should try his best to Establish Salat al-Layl in his home with his family. We then move on to Laylatul Qadr. We then move on to Laylatul Qadr. Laylatul Qadr, according to some scholars, is on a fixed night. And that was a statement of Ubay bin Ka'ib radiallahu anhu, whereby he said, Wallahi, wallahi inni la a'lamu ayya laylatin hi. By Allah, I know what night Laylatul Qadr is. هي الليلة التي أمرنا رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم بقيامها. It is the night in which the Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم commanded us to stand up and perform the night prayer. هي الليلة سبع وعشرين. It is the twenty-seventh night. However, when we corroborate the texts from the Son of the Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم, then that which we conclude is that Laylة Qadr moves and changes from night to night. In the time of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he admonished the people and he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said inni uritu laylat al-qadr thumma unsituha I, I was shown the night of al-qadr laylat al-qadr and then I was made to forget it faltamisuha fil ashr al-awakhir so seek it out in the last ten, I mean the last ten nights, fill witr in the last ten nights, rather the odd ten nights. Where inni ra'ita anni asjudu fi ma'in wutin, and indeed I saw that I was prostrating in clay and water. Abu Sa'id al-Khudri radiallahu anhu, the narrator of the hadith, he said, 
مطرنه ليله 21 it rained on the 21st night فوقف الناس في مصلى رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم and so the roof of the masjid had water running down through it and it was dripping through it on, onto the musalla of the messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم فنظرت اليه i looked towards the messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم وقد انصرف من صلاه الصبح and he صلى الله عليه وسلم had just left performing the fajr prayer ووجهه مبتل طينا وماء and his face sallallahu alayhi wasallam was dripping with clay and water and so in this year the messenger of allah sallallahu alayhi it occurred in his time that laylatul qadr in this particular year was on the 21st night and in the year Ubay ibn Ka'b mentioned, it occurred on the 27th night, so there is no contradiction between the two ahadith. And the reason why we say a Muslim should seek out Laylatul Qadr during the last odd nights of the last 10 nights is due to the statement of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, أَرَى رُؤْيَاكُمْ فِي الْعَشْرِ الْأَوَاخِرِ أرى رؤياكم في العشر الأواخر فاطلبوها في الوتر منها I see that your dreams and your visions have coincided with it being the last ten nights so seek it out in the last odd nights from the last ten nights and that's why we say that Muslims should strive on the odd nights however we don't say strive on the odd nights only rather a Muslim should strive on the odd nights and on the even nights and the reason why we say this is because Shaykh Taqiyuddin Ahmed ibn Abdul Halim ibn Abdul Salam ibn Taymiyyat al Harrani rahimahullah, he mentioned that a magnificent benefit whereby he said that the odd nights can be, can be considered as even when we look at the end of the month. So if the month ends on a 29, on a 29, then if we count back, the odd nights turn to even. The odd nights turn to even. And so a Muslim should strive both on the Odd and even nights. And obviously the supplication that a Muslim should read out during those nights is as the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam instructed Aisha radiallahu anha to say Allahumma inna ka'afuun tuhibbu al-afu fa'afu anni Oh Allah, you love to pardon or you are, you are the pardoner, you love to pardon, so pardon me. Then we move on to Zakat al-Fitr. Zakat al-Fitr, its ruling is that it is obligatory. As Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu said, فَرَضَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَسَلَّمْ زَكَاتِ الْفِطْرِ Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu said that the Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم made compulsory Zakat al-Fitr. And the reason why it is given, meaning that Zakat al-Fitr is given, is because it is a means of purification for the fasting person. قال ابن عباس رضي الله عنهما قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه قال ابن عباس رضي الله عنهما فرض رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم زكاة الفطر طهرة للصائم من اللغو والرفث ابن عباس رضي الله عنهما said that the messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم obligated زكاة الفطر as a purification for the fasting person from a lagu and obscene talk from idle talk and obscene talk and it is obligatory upon the male and female alike. Whether that male and female be a slave or a free person, and whether they be young or whether they be old. With regards to Zakat al-Fitr, then a person may ask, how is Zakat al-Fitr to be given? And that which we say, it is to be given as a sa'i. And a sa'i is a handful, equivalent to the sa'i of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam yudfa'u sa'an bi sa'i nabiyy sallallahu alayhi wa sallam it is to be given as a sa'i equivalent to the sa'i of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and it is to be given in food and the scholars rahimahullah they mentioned that the sa'i of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when it's weighed then it equates to roughly it being three kilograms 
So a person, when they give zakat al-fitr, they should roughly give three kilograms of food. Zakat al-fitr similarly has a time frame. And that time frame is before the Muslims establish the Eid prayer and congregation. The time frame is that before the Muslims establish the Eid prayer and the congregation. قال ابن عمر رضي الله عنهما فرض رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم صاعا من تمر أو صاعا من شعير على الحر والعبد والذكر والأنثى والصغير والكبير من المسلمين وأمر بها أن تؤدى قبل خروج الناس إلى الصلاة ابن عمر رضي الله عنهما من الله سبحانه وتعالى be pleased with him said that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made compulsory the zatat al-fitr upon the slave and upon the free, the male and the female, the young and the old amongst the Muslims. Asa'a of dates, asa'a of bali. And then he radiallahu anhu said, and he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam also ordered that this should be distributed before the people got to the Eid prayer. Okay, how about if a person delays it and forgets? Well, not forgets, but if he delays it and he gives the zakat al-fitr after the prayer, then Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu tells us that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu said, فَمَنْ أَدَّاهَا قَبْلَ الصَّلَاةِ فَهِيَ زَكَاةٌ مَقْبُولَةٌ وَمَنْ أَدَّاهَا بَعْدَ الصَّلَاةِ فَهِيَ صَدَقَةٌ مِنَ الصَّدَقَاتِ Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu informs us of the answer whereby he says that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has said whoever gives the zakat al-fitr before the prayer then it is a accepted zakat al-fitr and whoever gives it after the prayer then it is a sadaqah from the various sadaqat and the various charities that a person gives meaning that it is not considered to be from the zakat al-fitr and there occurs a difference of opinion between the scholars is zakat al-fitr to be given out in food or is it to be given out in money? Food or money? Then that which we say that the correct opinion and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best is that zakat al-fitr is to be given in food. Why is zakat al-fitr to be given in food? Zakat al-fitr is to be given in food because during the time the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam able to give zakat al-fitr in money? Yes, he was able. Was, did the mujib exist? It existed. Did the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam do so? He Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did it. And so, if the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was able to give zakat al-fitr in money, however he Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam chose to give it in food, shows us that it is obligatory for us to give it in food and not for us to give it in money. And that's why Abu Sa'id al-Khudri radiallahu anhu said, أَمَّا أَنَا فَلَا أَزَالُ أُخْرِجُهُ كَمَا كُنْتُ أُخْرِجُهُ He radiallahu anhu said, As for I, as for me, then I give my zakat al-fitr as I used to give it in the time of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And so, having mentioned these rulings pertaining to the month of Ramadan, we conclude this lecture of ours by supplicating to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He subhanahu wa ta'ala allows us to reach the month of Ramadan. Allahumma ahillahu alayna bil amni wal iman wa salamati wal islam. Waj'alna Allahumma mimman yastaghillu shahra Ramadan. فيجعله مزرعة لنفسه ويستثمر الخير على الدوام. We ask Allah subhanahu wa taala to make us of those who strive in the month of Ramadan in the ibada of Allah subhanahu wa taala. Ibn Rajab رحمه الله تعالى mentions. أتى رمضان مزرعة العباد لتطهير القلوب من الفساد فأد حقوقه قولا وفعلا وزادك فاتخذه إلى المعادي 
فمن زرع الحبوب وما سقاها تأوه نادما يوم الحصاد Ibn Rajab rahimahullah ta'ala says Ramadan has come as a time for a person and the slave to farm لِتَطْهِيرِ الْقُلُوبِ مِنَ الْفَسَادِ in order to cleanse the heart from corruption فَأَدِّ حُقُوقَهُ قَوْلًا وَفِعْلًا So Give Ramadan its rights in statement and in action. وَزَادَكَ فَاتَّخِذْهُ إِلَى الْمَعَادِ And your provisions take with you to the hereafter. فَمَنْ زَرَعَ الْحُبُوبَ وَمَا سَقَاهَا Whoever plants seeds and doesn't water it, تَأَوَّهَ نَادِمًا يَوْمَ الْحَصَادِ He painfully regrets the day of harvest. And to that we conclude.